if you're considering an offset account or a redraw account, make sure that you're getting tax advice and make sure that, you know, the, the tax agent knows the different structure and the differences between an offset and a redraw account because it can have huge ramifications in the future. Welcome to 360 Money Matters, where financial planners Billy and Andrew talk all things financial planning. This podcast aims to increase your knowledge and confidence with all things money. Each week, they will cover topics such as investing, cash flow, budgeting, saving, passive income, debt management, and much more, so you can live a life on your terms without limits. Hello and welcome back to another episode of the 360 Money Matters podcast. I'm Billy and I'm joined by my co-host, Andrew. Bills, here we are back again, back in the recording studio. Andrew, we are back again and absolutely love this time of week, bringing a whole heap of value to our listeners and our viewers across the airways. It was just because you get to talk to me. And the fact that I get to talk to you for half an hour as well. But what are we talking to everybody about today? So today we're talking all about refinancing. Well, I figured that it would be a, a pretty interesting topic more so just, you know, thinking a little bit in advance that there's talks about interest rates coming down and, you know, pick your time frame in terms of when that's going to happen. We won't go into that. But once interest rates start to come down, you start to see a bit of disparity between your existing loan and or your, the interest rate on your existing loan versus the interest rate on potentially what might be out there. And people start to think about, hey, is it worthwhile refinancing? Is it worthwhile refinancing? So we're going to look at what are some of the things that you should be considering when you're looking at refinancing your mortgage. Ooh, and I think this is a really fitting time as well too, because I'd say in the media, but in the banking industry, what we have seen happen, which is a really good sign, is that a lot of the majors are starting to now promote two year, sharper two-year fixed yeah. rates. Uh, so not that it's advice, but I'd be mindful of doing that if you're considering it, because if they're dropping rates, they're obviously trying to get people locked in. That's the future direction they think interest rates are going to go. So I'd suggest that that's probably the uh, the wrong time to be to be considering it uh, for the majority of the population anyway. But yeah, I think it's really fitting because we are starting to get closer and closer, and it seems like a, a slow moving train wreck in terms of us inching inching closer towards the Reserve Bank making the decision of reducing interest rates. Can you tell that me and Billy have a mortgage by the smile on our faces of uh, possible interest rate reduction? <laughs> Look, no, I don't think it's just that. I, I just love the commentary and the, the media attention that it's receiving around it. And, you know, you're starting to see other reserve banks around the world move and whether or not, and we won't know this until we look back on it in hindsight, but whether or not the reserve bank are being too conservative and whether they needed to move earlier than expected in saying that everybody's hoping for it, who have a mortgage, because it means that obviously your repayments come down. But uh, for those maybe that are living off things like term deposits and online savings accounts, yeah. maybe a bit of a bit of a different uh, bit of a different issue. But uh, Andrew, let's get into the crux of it. Where do we start? So look, I think that the starting point is where the primary driver is for for most people, and that's interest rate. So you know, you look at it and you say, okay. I'm paying an interest rate of, you know, 6.5% and I can get, you know, under 6%. So I want to refinance because I want my interest rate to go down because when your interest rate comes down, you pay less to the bank and happy days. Yep. Um, so, yeah, absolutely. Um, interest rate is a very, very big consideration when you're looking at refinancing. I think the only sort of caveat that I'll throw into that is have you – have you actually tried to negotiate with your existing lender? Now, it can be a bit of a sore point. I mean, some people's, you know, uh, a little bit more emotional about it in that, you know, if they haven't given me the sharpest rate now, then, you know, why should I stay with them and, and why should I leave? And that's perfectly, you know, rational. But, you know, for some of the reasons that we'll, we'll talk about a little bit later on in this podcast, it may be worthwhile looking at and exploring the option of putting in a call to your existing lender or getting your broker to putting in a call, the, getting your broker to put a call into your existing lender as to whether you can negotiate the interest rate down without having to go through the whole refinance process. Yeah. And speaking of stuff that's been in the media, a lot of the other stuff that has been in there as well too, is this thing called the loyalty tax. So what it is, is exactly what you were saying is that people get fed up with their existing lender because 
you know, they're not as, as sharp as what they should be. And they basically say, okay, I'm going to change from lender A to lender B. And at the same time, in the same breath, you can achieve the same result if you approach them and try and push them for a more competitive rate. Now, that works in the most effective way that I've seen when you've got something to compare it to. So you say, hey, you are our current lender. We've been with you for X amount of years. Our rate is here. I know that ABC Bank is offering it here. Can you match it? And it could be as simple as a 15, 20 minute phone call and away you go. But the, um, the, the downside of the loyalty tax, if you're with a lender that is not market competitive, the amount of money that you pay in additional interest over the life of the, the, the loan that you're with them for can be quite substantial. So making sure that you're on top of this is definitely one that has a significant difference in terms of how much interest you pay along the way. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, as you touched on it earlier, but fixed, variable, what are some of the considerations there? Yeah, I mean, look, interest rate differential between the two is is obviously uh, critical first and foremost, because you'll find that the difference between fixed and variable are going to be different. But as the name suggests, the fixed rate is fixed for a period of time, depending on how long you fix it for. So if you're in a position where you are happy with the rate on offer and you want a high degree of certainty around what the next umpteen years look like in terms of interest rate and your associated repayment, that could be a consideration if that's the case. If you are happy enough just to get whatever the, you know, the reflection of the variable rate is with the reserve bank, you know, if rates come down, I expect my interest rate with my bank to come down as well too. If that's your thinking and your approach, that's also the way that, you know, you'd, you'd lean in, in that regard as well too. If we dig a little bit deeper, there are some product restrictions with a fixed rate versus with a variable rate. With a variable rate, you have complete flexibility. If you want to make extra repayments into the loan, you can do that. Uh, most loans do offer some sort of offset product. We'll talk about offset versus redraw and bits and pieces down the track. But with a fixed rate, if you're making, say, additional repayments or if you have some savings in an offset account, you may lose some of that functionality with having a fixed account. Yep. So I think with all of this and, and not wanting to conclude or, or put the conclusion at the end is you've got to have a strategy around what your debt elimination looks like. And if you've got an accelerated, uh, accelerated debt elimination strategy, that's a bit of a mouthful, then you need to think about specifically what product you've got with what product features. It's not just about the interest rate on offer. Yeah. And you can take advantage of both, right? Like you can have a product that has, you know, part fixed, yeah. part variable and and take advantage of both and, and manage it in that way. But it's a matter of having a strategy and a structure that, that sits around it. Um, the next, you know, sort of big point or, or big sort of consideration when you're looking at refinancing is, you know, considering a principal versus a principal and interest repayment or an interest only repayment. Now, you know, one of the things that we talk about pretty frequently from a financial advice perspective is that if it's an affordability piece, so you're purchasing a property um, or you're doing something, you know, to buy yourself some time, yes, it can work. And yes, it may be a consideration to have interest only so that your repayments are lower for a period of time while you know that, you know, things are going to sort themselves out later because, I don't know, someone's taking time off work for maternity leave or whatever it is, then that's fine. But if you cannot afford a property on principal and interest repayments, our opinion on it is you shouldn't be purchasing that property. Yeah. If interest only is the only way that it's going to be affordable, then it just shouldn't be purchased at all um, because eventually – the bank is going to want you to start repaying your loan and eventually you're going to have to start making principal and interest repayments. Now, that being said, there, that does not mean that interest only is irrelevant or not a consideration. So if you want to structure your finances in the most tax effective environment, what some people will do is have their owner occupied property on principal and interest repayments, have either a offset account um, in a variable loan there or having a redraw facility to pay down that loan as fast as you possibly can and having all of your investment loans on interest only. Mm -hmm. So what you're doing is paying down all of your good debt via principal and interest repayments 
and not paying off your, oh, sorry, other way around, other way around, not paying off your good good debt in your investment debt. Now, sometimes this can confuse people in that, okay, that means I should never pay off my investment property. No, that's not what it means. What it means is you should pay off your investment property if that's going to be your strategy. It's just the first thing that you will do is pay off your owner-occupied property as quickly as you can and then move towards paying your investment property. So what you might do is do owner rock on principal and interest, investment property on interest only. Just be careful that rates can be different. Yeah. So interest only versus principal and interest can have a different cost associated with the interest rate. Mm -hmm. um, so you do need to throw that into the so the take out there is obviously interest rate differential between principal and interest versus interest only. But I think more importantly is the cash flow uh, ramifications of a principal and interest repayment versus interest only and whether or not interest only makes sense as part of the broader strategy. Because I share a similar opinion, Andrew. I don't think even though the product is available, my default position is we should not be borrowing money unless there's a really good case for it, but we should not be borrowing money where we don't have to pay it back other than service the interest. Yeah. And you're also delaying. So you're not, you're not actually, you know, alleviating yourself from paying back the principal. What you're doing is just delaying paying back yeah. the principal. So under a, I mean, let's, and this is a, a you know, simplistic example because most people will change things and refinance, but let's say you're interest only for a three year period versus a 30-year loan on principal and interest. On principal and interest, you'll pay the, the loan back over the course of 30 years mm -hmm. and you'll start paying it back from day one. On an interest-only loan, and if it's interest-only for, let's say, three years, what will happen is you will, for the first three years, not make any principal repayments mm -hmm. and then pay your loan back over a 27-year time yeah. horizon. Yeah. So your principal payments are going to be higher yeah from 27 years or after three years on an interest only loan than what your principal and interest will be. Even if the interest rate's the same because your loan term is three years shorter. Yep. And then the last thing to think about is the debt elimination strategy associated with interest only. Yep. Right. Cause that, that then plays into it as, as well too, but let's pivot into, so offset accounts is yep. a really common feature that, that we talk to people about. So in its simplistic form, um, the majority of loans, the majority of loan products will offer an offset account. You may need to pay a, a fee associated with it, but essentially what it does do, and this is getting a, a little bit technical, but each and every month in a hypothetical example, let's just say, and this would be nice if this was the case, but your repayments are $1,000 a month. Yep. And that contains a principal and interest component. And let's just say you've only had the loan for a short period of time, so $900 of that $1,000 payment is interest and $100 is principal reduction. Yep. If you've got money sitting in the offset account, what will happen is when the monthly repayment is due and the calculation between the, the $900 interest repayment and the $100 principal repayment will get adjusted depending on how much money is sitting in the offset account. So the way that that gets calculated is every day, the closing balance of your loan and what's sitting in your offset account gets calculated. And the more money that you've got in your offset account for the longer you've got, the interest component reduces and the amount of principal repayment goes up. So in this hypothetical example, if you've got money sitting in your offset account and you're making a thousand dollar repayment, rather it being 90 90%, $900 interest and 10%, $100 principal, it may be something like $850 of interest and $150 of principal. So having an offset account and using it effectively can help you pay off your loan faster because it's creating a bigger principal repayment when you're making your repayments. Yeah. Yeah. That exactly. would have been much easier with a whiteboard, Andrew. <laughs> We keep saying it, but we need to invest in what? Absolutely. Yeah, for sure. Um, but yes, I mean, absolutely. An, an offset account is going to reduce the amount of interest that you pay, which means that you pay your loan faster. The only thing that can sometimes trip people up is, hey, I didn't have any money in my offset account and I put a large lump sum in, 
but run my repayment stayed the same. Mm -hmm. That will always happen. So your repayments will still be the same. The only difference is the more of your repayments goes to paying down the loan faster. Yeah. So your loan term will, will compress. Not going to go into the intricate details of it, um, but there is a difference between an offset and a redraw account. Yeah. And it's important. I'm going to throw over to our, you know, our tax agents um, and our accountants mm -hmm. to really give that advice. But an offset account is merely an account that reduces the amount of interest that you pay on your loan. A redraw account is physically paying down the loan and having a facility to take out extra from your loan. Now, how does that differ and what does that mean? Well, I'll use an example. Mm -hmm. Let's say you have a investment property. You've got money that's sitting on the investment property or, or you have a, an investment property that has an offset account attached to it and you have an investment property that has a redraw account attached to it. On the account where you've got an offset account attached to it, you, you know, you've paid off your owner-occupied property, you're paying money into your investment property. Now all of a sudden, let's say that you decide to take an amount of money that's in your offset account and use that to buy a car. Now let's say you take out $50,000 from that offset account. Your loan has now increased by $50,000 and so you're paying interest mm -hmm. of an additional $50,000 loan in the offset account. It's sitting on an investment property, it's tax deductible. You do that same scenario in a redraw account. You put money toward your redraw account like you would your offset. You decide to take $50,000 out to buy a car. Now, let's say this is just for personal use. Mm -hmm. The thing that will dictate whether it's tax deductible, because it's a loan drawdown rather than just taking money out of an account, the thing that will dictate whether it's tax deductible is the purpose and use of those funds. It's personal use. It's now not tax deductible creates an absolute nightmare for your accountant because your accountant needs to now calculate when your bank does the loan reporting, they're just going to give you all of the interest that you've paid. They're not going to tell you that, hey, this portion of interest was tax deductible, this portion of interest was not tax deductible. It can be one, a nightmare, but yeah. two, a massive trap in you know tripping up and in essence um, being caught by the ATO. And so the general rule that I'll throw out there or, or the advice that I'll throw out there is if you're considering an offset account or a redraw account, make sure that you're getting tax advice and make sure that, you know, the, the tax agent knows the different structure and the differences between an offset and a redraw account because it can have huge ramifications in the future. You know, I think just to close that one out too, Andrew, where we're seeing a really big uh, trip up when it comes to this is when we see people, which is a common strategy, converting their original owner occupier yep. into an investment. So basically you've outgrown your current place. So you want to upgrade, you want to keep your existing place, but you're converting it from an owner occupier into an investment. You want the debt as high as you possibly can when it is an investment property, because that's good debt. It's deductible debt as opposed to the other way around. And if you get that redraw offset mix incorrect, you can often shoot yourself in the foot and not realize it until after the fact. And then you look back and go, geez, I wasted a huge opportunity and yeah, can run into trouble with the ATO. Your accountant could charge you additional fees. So always a good uh, opportunity to get uh, to get some advice um, surrounding that. One of the things that we'll talk about is the, the loan term. But before we get into that, one of the things that I'd like to point out that I think is often overlooked is refinancing and resetting the loan term. So what that potentially looks like is, let's just say you've been with a lender for three years and just to use some round numbers, you're 30 at the time when you take out the loan. So a standard mortgage term is 30 years. You're projected to, if you make the contracted repayments, you're projected to have that paid out by age 60. Let's just say you've been with your lender for three years and you're now 33 and you go and refinance to another lender. Most of the time, they'll revert you back to a 30-year loan. If you stay the course and make your contracted repayments, you've got 30 years with the new lender plus the original three years that you had with your first lender. You're now on a 33-year loan term, payback at age 63 versus age 60. So even though the interest rate on paper may be less, 
resetting the loan term and reducing your repayments and your cash flow could be an issue that actually makes it more expensive over time in terms of how much interest you've paid and how long it takes you to pay back the loan as well too. That's often overlooked because a lot of the time we're just looking at, hey, what's the cheapest rate? What's the cheapest rate? And if you go and get um, a loan term and you reset the loan term and extend it back to say 30 years, naturally the repayments are going to be cheaper anyway in 90% of the case unless the interest rates have gone sky high. So most people will look at it and think that the reduced repayments are just because I'm getting a sharper interest rate. That's not necessarily the case. It's because, yes, it could be the interest rate, but it's also because you've extended the loan term as well too. So it's a really easy trap to fall into. And a lot of people don't realize it till they're a decade into their repayments going, hang on a sec, this thing hasn't been paid back as fast as I thought. How come I've still got X amount of dollars outstanding? And it can be a real issue. Exactly right. And here's you know some, some actual tangible numbers with it. Let's say you've got a loan of $600,000. Yep. And let's say your interest rate is 5.5%, which I know is ridiculously cheap for, for right now, but we're trying to average it out for you know the 30-year term. So let's say you've got $600,000 loan, 5.5% interest rate, principal and interest repayments of 25 years. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry, principal and interest repayments and on a loan term of 25 years. Over the course of those 25 years, you would have paid $505,000 in interest. Now let's say that you increase the loan term to 30 years. Interest rate stays the same, yep. principal and interest loan amount stays the same. The only difference is you're looking at a 25 year term and a 30 year term. Now all of a sudden, your interest that you're gonna pay by extending the loan term from 25 to 30 years, that's the only adjustment mm -hmm. that we've made, $626,000 worth of interest. That's $121,000 more interest on just use by paying, by converting from a five year term. So at five years refinancing and not changing the loan term. Yep. An even scarier example. Okay, you think that, and the reason that I say that it's a scarier example is because you think that you're doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. Same scenario, right? So $600,000 loan, you're on a 5.5% interest rate, principal and interest, and 25-year term. You see that Bank X is now offering a 5% interest rate. So you say, fantastic, let's go $600,000 loan, we drop the interest rate from 5% to 5.5% on principal and interest repayments. Five to five. Yeah, sorry, 5.5 yeah. to yeah. five. And what's happened in the background is your loan term has gone to 30 years instead of 25. But your repayments have gone down, so you feel like you're doing the right thing. Your interest rate has gone down, you feel like you're doing the right thing. But the interest that you'll pay is $559,000. So you're actually worse off by refinancing by $54,000 by increasing the loan term from 25 years to 30 years, even though you're having a reduction in interest rate. So the really big key takeaway out of this is not to not refinance. That is definitely not what we're trying to say. Yeah. But if you're refinancing, match the loan term. If you're refinancing a 25-year loan, match it to 25 years. Or better yet, if you can, reduce the loan term. That's even better. But at a minimum, have a consideration as to what you're doing with the loan term and if that's going to be right for you. I mean, you could say, yep, I'm going to increase the loan term to 30 years, my repayments are going to go down, but I'm going to put extra repayments to pay down the loan. That's fine. But making sure that you're at least aware of the fact that if you increase your loan term, it almost doesn't matter how good the interest rate is sometimes, that you're better off actually, if you're not going to make any additional repayments, probably staying where you are. Yeah. The way to offset that is to match the repayments. But once again, it's a, it's a, it's a discipline thing. But um, there's it's a really... When you put some numbers around it, it's really interesting because it highlights how big of a difference it can make when you think you're doing the right thing and you are, but you just need to take it that little step further. And yeah. I, I think the call out here is if it's, if it's all too, um, you know, getting lost in the numbers or all, all too overwhelming, just get some advice. Yeah. So if you talk to a mortgage broker, if you talk to a financial advisor, if you talk to your accountant, they'll be able to run you through this to say, okay, what's the most optimal way of, of doing it? 
Um, and there's different strategies for, for different scenarios and things like that, but it's not necessarily as straightforward as, hey, I want to refinance to a cheaper interest rate and I'm going to do that every year or two simply because I know that I must pay the cheapest rate. Yeah. Yes, that's true, but that's only half the story. Andrew, thank you very much, Bills. I think that covers it off really nicely. Yeah, and to our viewer, viewers and listeners, hope you got a whole heap of value uh, out of that. If you've got any questions, reach out to Andrew and I. Details are always in the show notes. Um, if you did get some value, please like, subscribe, and share with family and friends so they can benefit as well. And we look forward to catching you on the next one. Thank you. Thanks for listening today. If you have any questions on what we talked about or would like to have a chat about your money journey, visit us at 360fs.com.au. Just a reminder to our listeners that the information contained in this podcast is general in nature and is not intended as personal recommendations for the audience. Please consider whether the information suits your circumstances before acting on it. This information is provided by Billy Amarinas and Andrew Nicolou of 360 Financial Strategists Petrarchy Limited, authorised representatives and credit representatives of AMP Financial Planning.